rather than having mysterious models, we will force people to tell their story and they put numbers on the story. It will be easier to check the quality of the discussion. Today's guest is recently retired professor of environmental science and technology, Mario Giampietro from uh, the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Studies in Barcelona, Spain. I knew of uh, Mario's work uh, back when I was getting my PhD on an acronym called MUSIASM, which stands for Multiscale Integrated Analysis of Societal and Ecosystem Metabolism. Mario has an academic background in chemistry, biology, and social sciences, and has authored or co-authored over 100 uh, academic articles and written many books on sustainability, energy analysis, and agriculture, including The Biofuel Delusion and Resource Accounting for Sustainability Assessment. Uh, I have found that biophysical analysts, perhaps especially Spanish ones, are able to speak truth to power. And I think you will see what I mean by that in this conversation with Dr. Mario Giampietro. Saludos, Mario. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. Nice being here with you. Congratulations on your recent retirement. It's a big event. Huh? <laughs> so I am now blessed having this podcast that suddenly I get to have conversations with all the people that 15 years ago when I was getting my PhD were the rock stars in the fields of, of biophysical economics, including you. I would, you, were, you were one of the, uh, the icons in the field. So, and here we are. Yeah, we're um, not too many, eh? let's put it this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not too many. That's true. Uh, but I have had quite a few of them uh, on my podcast. So so let me ask you, um, why is it there are so many Spanish people who are energy and, and collapse aware of systems versus the total global population? Or is that just my small sample size? No, it, it is true that especially in Valladolid, they have a, a, a big group. Ah, uh, they is called GID. Uh, G, uh, because it's a Spanish uh, acronym. It's about energy and development, sustainability, and something like that. Uh, they had the first one uh, making accounting uh, of the resource use. And this resonates with Barcelona, where I am located where they had basically the the first big group of ecological economics with Juan Martinez Salier and mm -hmm. even though that the, the Martinez Salier and the group here they didn't do much of uh, um, accounting they were making the economic part the story the importance of of considering the but they were not getting into the but that this led to a sensibility in spain with the work on Naredo, Naredo was another important uh, person that works a lot. They had um, Margalef, an ecologist, it was a sort of odum. So there was a sort of uh, background that made possible to uh, have this uh, school in Valladolid. As a matter of fact, they came uh, three or four weeks ago in, uh, in Barcelona because we are trying to... Uh, to check the common point of our approach and their approach. And uh, yeah, but then there are people really, they are buying farms, small farms, because they are waiting for the catastrophe of implosion. You know, it's kind of uh, like the billionaire in the United States, they are uh, waiting for the collapse. It's a lot of people are now aware yeah. of this. The, the, yeah. The world has caught up to the vile physical story that you've been saying uh, for for decades. Uh -huh. So so let's get into your work. Um, yeah, one of your main projects has been an acro acronym MUSIASM. I'm not sure yeah. how to pronounce it, but it stands for Multi Scale Integrated Analysis of Societal 
and ecosystem metabolism. Yeah. So can, I, I know you're just a retired professor <laughs> and you're used to teaching PhD students, but can you briefly explain to our non-academic viewers yeah. for the most part, what, what this work really is about? Uh, I mean, I, I think that this is something different. No, really different in the sense is uh, an attempt to use complexity to do quantitative analysis. At the moment, uh, it is embarrassing. People doing quantitative analysis use uh, a differential equation, like Newton, like <laughs> 100 years ago. And the, what is the problem with differential equation? You have only one, one time scale. Okay, so let's imagine you are comparing oh, the evolution of China and, and Europe over 50 years. Okay, uh, if you are using the T of one year, the one using in economic models, whatever, you cannot get changes like population structure. You know, in China now they have 60% of adults because of one child policy, and we have 40% of adults. They work 2,500 hours per worker per year, we work 1,700. So basically, the China has almost the double of our work per capita in the economy than us, okay? Unbeatable, no? You cannot do anything against this. No? <laughs> of course, in 40 years, they will become all retired, and it will be a major problem, and probably they will not accept to work 2,500 hours per year. Then you cannot see these things if you are using one scale only. Okay, you you cannot see if I see with a microscope at your face, I cannot see your nose, <laughs> no matter what. You know that we have to learn how to combine different scales and different narrative and different representation. Okay, like done in medicine. In medicine, you have the X-ray, you have MRI, you have the blood test, you have a lot of different tests. Nobody would think about mixing all these numbers in a single mega equation of 1,000 variable to describe how you are. No. So what this museum does is uh, relational analysis. You have one um, lens at which you see something. Then with another lens, lens you see how the uh, liver works. In another, you see the whole body, how you are doing. Then you establish relation between the characteristic of one view to another to another. And this is possible. You can say, if this is in this way, on the border, there has be in another way for this other piece, okay? So we have like four different uh, lenses. One lens look at the affective interaction, the, dial, the daily life of household. So the household you may have with kids, retired of uh, all the adults, and they have to do things. So you can describe how much time, energy, uh, technology is allocated. So you have the total for the household, and now it's allocated across the different things. No? Then you can redo the same at the whole household sector, and you will have a relation. Okay. Then we have another, and then you see the desirability of your state no then you have another level that we call macro uh, scope and then you have the whole economy so the household sector is a part of the uh, paid work sector in which you have agriculture and for each of these you can go all smaller smaller using the and for each of these you can see how much electricity fuel but then you are building a sudoku because the electricity of all the <laughs> of all the sector must be total uh, within and across okay then we have another it's called mesoscope that is how much you are importing because if we are not considering the import, people are just wasting time. When you say, you know, we are dematerializing in Europe, no, we are using uh, embodied in what we import 140 million worker equivalent. Okay, so half of our workforce is embodied in what we import. We import 70% of the feed. We import 85% of the energy. So. They are talking about we are dematerializing, we are but within the the border of, of the country, not including. And the last one is the microscope, is the 
flow or primary flows outside inside what we are getting from the nature and getting and dumping in nature and this can be though done at the local level so you can have the environmental pressure that would be how much supply capacity how much sink capacity you need from nature and compare it with the characteristic of the ecological fund that you are affecting and then you can see the impact so what happened you have all these four things. No, I mean, we did. I mean, we have been <laughs> working now for 10 years. We have that. What is fantastic is that you have benchmarks. So I can say, give me a population. Okay. How this urban, rural, how many are retired, blah, blah, blah. And then you say, okay, you want uh, healthcare. What type of healthcare you want? The, the type of healthcare of Sweden or Norway or Romania or, <laughs> and then you start putting together the piece and you can say, okay, if you do this at this level of analysis, you will need these type of things. How you are producing them? Are you importing or not? If you are not importing, <laughs> how we are producing, what are the technological that we call the sequential pathway, you know, extraction and blah, 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 till you, you do it. And then you can calculate. Uh, and then how does it work this? This you can do one, a diagnostic to see how your country is different from another. Oh, uh, you can really see uh, they are using more electricity because they have hydro. Or they are using more of this in Poland because they have coal. I mean, you can explain the differences. And then you can run scenarios. You know, what if? You know, we want to cut 70% of emissions. Yes, let me see how you do it. I mean, <laughs> because you have things to do. You know, you have a list of things to do. And let me see how you can cut 70% of emission. Uh, so uh, it is very open in the sense we call it a deliberation support because it's not even a decision support. It, it brings you up in the sense you start looking at the fact that there are a lot of implications, a lot of concerns, and uh, how to prioritize. This I cannot do in English. Prioritize concern. No, uh, that's, this is. So, so in order to make good decisions, we have to understand the problem first. Yeah, that we don't. Yeah, right. Yeah. We, we, at the uh, moment, we are, we are operating on, on, on policy legend, you know, the circular economy. Circular economy is against the law of thermodynamics. I mean, we are making fun of the people that were believing to the flat earth, but believing the, the circular economy is the same level. Eh? This against the law of thermodynamics. We are metabolic system, deceivative system, we must take from our environment and dump into the environment. It is against anything known <laughs> that we can close the loop inside. So can can you expand on that? Why do you use the word metabolism in, in your core uh, title of your work? Because, uh, again, this will go to the heart of, of uh, energetics, okay? Uh, transformation of energy are uh, really, really belong to the complexity uh, issue. Uh, first of all, energy doesn't exist. It's a semantic concept. You have plenty of forms of energy, you know, but electricity is not energy for um, your car or for a person. We cannot eat electricity. And at the same way, ham is food for us, but not for a, 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 an Islamic person. So uh, there is no energy. Nor, nor for a car. Nor for a car, yeah. So there are, first of all, there is no energy. And second, when you get to the issue of how to use a transform energy, the, you have always to do a, a process of autocatalysis. It's not input-output, it's chicken-egg. Okay, let's give you an example. A cow goes to a pasture to get energy, okay? First of all, you start with, en you must have energy, the cow has to move, <laughs> muscle and see the things and know how to eat grass. Okay. Then you get grass. Grass is not energy for a cow. It's a primary energy sources. It's only after you are digesting this, you get carbohydrate and other things and move the cows. So in this very simple example, you have three types of energy and uses. The mix of energy carrier, information, and technology, the muscle, you know. Second, a primary energy, like for us, would be oil, 
coal or wind or sun. Then you have energy carrier, electricity, fuel. These things are different. You are all people that do analysis of energy, energy in, energy out. And you do not have this number. This number do not exist. They make sense only if you are analyzing them inside an autocatalytic loop. How much you need to do that? Do you have enough uh, uh, capital or technology to do it? How much? You know, this type of is totally missing. I mean, and I think this has been the big disaster of energy analysis in the 70s and the 80s. I, I'm old enough to remember <laughs> I, I was in the States and uh, uh, the, the dream was net energy analysis. This was the heroi part, no? In reality, it is not that simple because in the energy return on investment, you don't have a size, first of all. Uh, then you have a flow flow. There is no fund. You know, and then there is no distinction between primary energy sources and energy carrier. Because if you have an output larger than an input, someone has to pay. That is, the primary resources is not included in the ROI analysis. So what I'm saying, okay, I don't want to get technical because maybe people cannot understand. What I'm saying is that uh, energetics is the ultimate <laughs> complexity um, problem. And unfortunately, this has been totally missed because when in the 80s, the energy analyst, you know, uh, by the white flag said, we, we are not producing anything useful. There are papers on, on, on science saying, you know, is net energy of any use. Uh, then the economic energy analysts get in that they do not have an, any idea what they are talking about. And then these are those they are uh, running the, the, the show now. So on, on this question, then your uh, point is that comparing energy is not only apples and oranges, but it's apples and oranges and pears and plums and kumquats. Within a and process of either selling it or either eating them. There is a yeah. larger context. Yeah, no, I I understand and agree with that, which means that not only are you talking about complexity theory, but this is a complex thing to understand and explain to people. Yeah. And society doesn't like complex things because we just like to parse things into dollars and then we or yeah. euros and we make yeah. decisions on that. And this is not easy to do with what you just said. It, it is something that should start in school. It should start. How, how in school. would we do that? How would we do that? I, I think that they should change the way we teach things at, at school, because the, all the energetics, uh, metabolism, things, these are, or oh, let alone the discussion of multiple scales. Uh, this idea that we have only one scale is absurd, no? Depending on, again, if I'm using a microscope, if I'm using a telescope, if I use my eye, I, if I use X-ray, I see different things. Uh, and which one is the real one? Uh, por favor, pardon. Uh, all are real. Depend, it depends on uh, how I am looking at. So uh, this is something that should be uh, deserve a reflection, let's put it this way. I, I totally agree. But before we do that, we have to even teach young people uh, what energy is and why it's important to our lives. We're still not even doing that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but we are victim of the success of, of economics. This is the point. We are intoxicated. Because if you imagine, we have a, a, a discipline. I, I, I work with the Kozo Mayumi, which is a professor of economics, so I, I respect the category, what I'm saying. But w what I'm saying is that uh, economics assume that uh, uh, absolute scarcity is impossible because it works with price. If you have price, there is a moderate scarcity. So you can use technology, trade the things. But if you have absolute scarcity, you no longer have price. You don't have a market. You have either war or solidarity, but you don't have market. Okay. So we are using a science. They assume the absolute scarcity is impossible to study absolute scarcity, how to avoid it. I mean, <laughs> uh, guys, it's uh, no, no. Uh, uh, economics do not, is not capable of uh, comparing the size of process economic process to the size of ecological process 
e, will e, that ever change? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. We, uh, you know, the normal signs and post-normal signs. No, when you have uh, uh, a big success, a discipline became normal. Nobody questioned the assumption. So the physicists give us the atomic bomb. So whatever they say now, that before the Big Bang, there was nothing. That uh, with the uh, boson, our life will change dramatically. Everyone believe it, even though maybe it is not <laughs> that clear. And the economics made possible for us to create money out of nothing, you know, the financial operation. So, and this is our life thunder depend on this. So nobody now is questioning economics. This is delivered you see is a is a discipline that delivered to society well the, the the discipline of economics was born on the backs of the carbon pulse and ironically was unaware of of the carbon pulse uh -huh. yeah 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 maybe so, when the so, pulse will be over we will have a different economics i mean i'm yeah, not saying that all the economics right. is is uh, useless i mean forget it i mean fantastic and moreover economists did a uh, huge contribution to ecological economics uh, what i'm saying is that as long as we have the american dream as the myth that uh, give us a group identity there is nothing we can do Unless we get into a rediscussion of the fact that the American dream, that 10 billion people on this planet will have the same uh, living standard of the United States, and everyone believe it, is what keep together, glue together people. Uh, if Until we believe this, there is nothing we can do, and we will be trapped, remain trapped into economic narratives. Getting back to my question, what is the relevance and importance of the word metabolism in your uh, in in your acronym? Does society have a metabolism, and why yeah. is that important? Of course, the metabolism. Uh, the society has a metabolism, and the metabolism uh, uh, implies that there is an autocatalysis. The system is capable of getting the energy and the resources that it is consuming to express function is made of different parts so you have uh, uh, multi-scale things you have the liver is operating as a liver but at the same time is a part of the larger system and moreover in that case you have a group autocatalysis if the different uh, parts work for each other look in what we do uh, in in the um, in the society, you have that the household is reproducing human activity. Then you have the agriculture is producing energy for the humans, the endosomatic energy. And my energy and mining is producing energy and material for the exosomatic part, you know, the machines, the, the infrastructure. Then you have the manufacturing that is building the exosomatic device, and then you have the service sector that is uh, generating institution and taking care of the human fund. So you have five organs. No, I'm telling you, I mean, we don't have time. This is exactly uh, like uh, the structure of an ecosystem. So if you are using the standard, you know, the Latin talking of relational analysis, you can define that a society is expressing a metabolic pattern exactly like a, 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 an organism, even though people believe that this is absurd, is uh, hetero, heterodox, but it is. So, so in my own life and behaviors, I have difficulty choosing things to override my own metabolism. Uh -huh. uh, how do, do societies choose when we have a metabolism, or don't we choose? Look, uh, <clears throat> the society has a list of things to do. And then you can have the list from statistics. You know, statistics is the state of the state, is how a society learns how to describe itself. So what the society does, there is a part that reproduces humans, household, and a part that uh, stabilizes the economic process. Then within the economic process, you have agriculture that does food. The agriculture is divided in animal production. <laughs> the animal pro Every time you go down, there are the final cause, if you are using relational analysis, why you have to do what you are doing.
then of course the society can decide to change the type of final cause, you know, we became vegetarian, we don't produce uh, animals anymore, or can decide to change the priority over the different things, you know, because unfortunately people do not know how things work, but in a society, 100% of the time, 90, 92, 93% goes in not working. Okay, so we are operating all the society with 8% of our time, uh, 700 hours per capita per year. If you divide, divide the hour work by the population, it depends where you are. It could be 750, 700, 800. Well. And that, that includes babies and old people? No, no, the babies and, uh, are on the other. I'm, I'm telling you okay. the working time in the paid work. Okay. Okay. So then 76 percent of this go in the service. You see? Then you don't have time to do real things. This is why we are importing, making the, the things because for the energy, all the energy that we consume in one year oh, is generated by eight hours of work. Uh, I repeat, eight hours of work. Be because of our subsidy from fossil hydrocarbons? Yeah, of course. Be I mean, the, yeah. the idea is that you divide the energy consumption of a country by the hours of work in the energy sector. Yeah. Eight hours. Okay, if we had uh, fossil energy like uh, Saudi Arabia, we had to work more because <laughs> we had to do the, the extraction, the refining, and things. We are in Europe. We are just getting uh, energy carriers, and we print money to pay for it. And of course, we may and the same for uh, agriculture. This is why you have tractors, no? What we have industrial agriculture because you are producing all the food that you are uh, eating in a year with 40 hours in Europe, in the States, much less. In the States, they are producing like one tons of crops per hour. I mean, this is uh, unthinkable, uh, talking about a circular economy, if you were serious about respecting the natural cycles, no? Uh, I'm telling you, the people do not know. Uh, we are intoxicated by money. We cannot appreciate the importance of biophysical constraints. Which is why I invited you to be a guest on this show, because you've been telling this story for 40 years, um, and very few people are listening. But now suddenly with Ukraine and Russia, and now recently Israel, and people are worried about Iran and the Straits uh -huh. of Hormuz, people are starting to understand that money and technology are not the primary drivers, that it's ecosystems and energy and materials that underpin uh, all this money and, and stuff. Yeah. So your, your ideas still might uh, um, germinate and, and bear fruit. Let's hope. Uh, yeah. So, so um, you also work on complexity, emergence, and adaptive cycles, which is another topic that people don't know much about. And I've not had anyone on the show talk about adaptive cycles. Can you briefly explain what an adaptive cycle is and why those are relevant to our current yeah. global situation? Yeah, I mean, the adaptive cycle, the idea comes from Buzz Olling, uh, that is a theoretical ecologist. And I would say that this as uh, theoretical ecology is by far the um, the discipline that got into the evolution because everyone talk about evolution but uh, and then uh, this require a little bit <laughs> to get into complexity okay uh, a complex adaptive system is not only a material things there is not only a tangible part it is also an not tangible, how do you say, uh, semiotic, let's put it this way, part. So uh, this was the, the um, Simon, the father of complexity, the first one, was saying, okay, we are in a situation which have recipes, they are making processes, they are making recipes. Okay. Then uh, Prigogine are saying there are genetic information that can make uh, organism or phenotype that make genetic information. Okay, So basically you have, and then this has been extended to uh, human society by Luhmann, the famous sociologist, German sociologist. They said, what is a society? It's a bunch of communications. They are used to stabilize a bunch of interactions. They are used to stabilize uh, communication. Okay. 
uh, uh, we, we can go into it uh, just uh, five seconds using biosemiotic is in reality you have on the top the meaning of things, types, the communication, and the bottom you have token instances of things. So basically you have uh, the semiotic appears that you have represent, it would be the communication, act, there would be interaction, and then you have interpretation. So in the cycle, you are interpreting your action, moving from instance to type to have better communication. Okay, and then having better communication, you interpret the better communication to a better <laughs> interaction, you know, and then you move from type to instance. So you have that this uh, cycle is a continuous resonance between type and instance, instance and type. Uh, Margalef, there is a famous uh, ecologist in Spain, call it like the ecosystem send message to themselves into the future. In the sense, you are giving a genotype in a specific area, they do something, they organize an ecosystem. In this organization, some phenotypes are, are eliminated and some are amplified. This change the genotype and this going on and on. And this could be for human system the same. You are defining social role and institution, then you get into a social practice, what we do, and then the genius of uh, Lehman, uh, Lumen uh, is that then you have a psychic structure that defines whether or not you like it. And then is the psychic structure that on the loop define what communication you like or not, you know, the cancel con uh, culture or the political process, basically. So you can apply, it's exactly the same, uh, for ecosystem and genetic information and for um, societies. But again, uh, Nate, uh, these things uh, in school, no, so basically if you start discussing this, this type of narrative, people really look at you like if you are uh, coming from another planet. But these things have been out for 50 years, what I'm saying. What I'm saying, that this is not normal. We have a sort of filter of whatever is uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, the famous uncomfortable knowledge is kept out of our educational system, is kept out of our discussion of sustainability. Uh, because, I mean, I am, I really... I cannot believe that I have to explain how to get a legal loop or biosemiotic. This is 50 year old. It's not that, you know, it's a new theory that came out last year, but nobody knows. That is, uh, what is if you talk about Kuzner curse, whatever other uh, <laughs> legend that, that's completely ridiculous, uh, everyone knows, no? <laughs> well, let's, let's move to that. Um... How has our modern society's uh, preference for reductionism, especially in uh, the academy and science, exacerbated uh, the, the issue that you just uh, outlined, the complexity of working with, with different scales on what's really important to, to our society? How, how has reductionism led us astray from what we really need to focus on? Yeah, I mean, I believe that this came exactly from this uh, adaptive cycle. In the sense, uh, you need a society that has a very strong group identity, is very motivated. Okay, so what motivated the Western civilization? The American dream and the Cartesian dream. The Cartesian dream is whatever we want to do, we do it. It's just a matter of more technology, more innovation, we do it. Okay, so this gives a feeling to people that we are in the right society, we are in the right group identity. And then, of course, this, because of oil, uh, this made possible to uh, have a better standard of living. So basically, everyone uh, perceived that the American dream and the Cartesian dream is where to go. No, um, What happened that at this point, this was so strong that whatever was... Uh, going against, you remember the limit to grow, something like that. No, whatever was uh, going against this 
was uh, considered as dangerous for society. Because, I mean, let's make a step backward. No, uh, why we have science? We have science to get new knowledge, but we have science to stabilize the establishment. You know, before the French Revolution, you say you have to pay taxes. Why? Because the king says so. Uh, why the king knows? Because God <laughs> appointed the king. After the French Revolution, he said, you have to pay tax. Why? Because the government say. And why the government? No, because he followed the scientific advice. You know? So we use science to stabilize the establishment. So at this point, it's very delicate that the, I mean, I'm telling you, I, I mean, we can, we can go, it's uh, uh, my uh, retired. I got a, a, a big project from European Union, no? And then and we were looking at the different narratives used in the sustainability, no? And you're looking one by one, it's all bullshit. I mean, <laughs> they, are, they, they don't make any sense. They are not possible there. And, and then, of course, when we were discussing, because it was uh, European Union was paying, no, so we were. Uh, they say, of course, uh, I had people that told me, but we cannot go on public and say we know <laughs> they all these harbushes. We don't have the slightest idea what to do. I mean, this is not acceptable. In uh, uh, so, what do we have? We have Greta that say that we should stop uh, all fossil energy. Say, okay, guys, how do you feed the cities? <laughs> <laughs> if you stop to use fossil energy. I mean, th there is a total no divide among what people want to do and the idea that you have to have how, uh, how this will be possible. And this cannot be discussed because as soon as whoever does, no, not big models, back on the envelope calculation, you see that what they are talking about is not possible. I agree with that. I think you're pointing out two things, though. Um, science still does exist because you are a scientist and you're modeling or have modeled in your career, the biophysical reality. It's just the political and economic filter of what science is accepted is limiting, uh, science's positive contribution to our future. Could, could I say it that way? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, in a way, this is a tragedy because even my students that have been with me like uh, years as PhD, if they want to get a job, they have to go in project on circular economy. <laughs> if they want to be published, you have to say yes, because uh, I'm old enough. I remember that at the beginning when I was getting called for research was, we have a problem, do we have an idea? Okay. Now, do we want to implement this solution? <laughs> Can you uh, provide how? This uh, 10 years later. 10 years later. We are implementing this. Can you prove that we are right? You know, now the, the science, the way it gets funded, changed dramatically. Now, basically, we are just supporting the claim of, of, of the government or the establishment. Or was. We are no longer have a, a, a room for maneuvering. But see, I, I have a model proving that it's not possible. You will not get money, no matter what. Do you have a hope or a fear that uh, once the European Union or the global uh, governments of the world figure out the situation we're in, that you will be called out of retirement to work with uh, people at Valladolid and, and other biophysical researchers who actually understand what's going on? Look, I believe that they more or less know that it's not working. This is what we got. We got 7.5 million. Eh? And that probably was to try to check a plan B, you no, know, to see where the weakness were. No, we, we were given money to check the credibility of the narrative used for the police. So, I mean, it's obvious that they have a sort of uh, uh, inch that, how do you say in, uh, in English, the, they An feel inkling. that yeah. there is something that, that uh, is not good. Uh, again, I believe that uh, it, it is difficult for them, uh, not, not, not European Union, all the governments. Uh, in, uh, I have a, a fantastic piece of a comedian that states that all the uh, State of the Union, uh, or the old president from the last one to Nixon and before, about the fact that they will fix the energy problems <laughs> in five yeah, years. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. It's, it's John Stewart, uh, yeah. Daily Show then, clip. Yeah, uh, I show so that to my it, students. It, it is not 
in Europe, the, the, the legitimacy of modern states is based on the fact that they know what they are doing, that they are doing policy-based, no, uh, scientific-based policy, evidence, scientific evidence policy, evidence policy. But my question is, um, there are enough people in the world, it's not a lot, but it's still plenty, that are working on biophysically informed analysis that although there are no solutions that are politically acceptable with our current situation, there are a lot of responses and good research and good relevant questions that academic minded people can be working on. So how do we, how do we build that bridge? Or do you think that's too, too far of a gap to ever, uh, bridge? Look, I believe that uh, and this is uh, is one of your papers that I really liked a lot. That uh, ecological economics and all that we didn't manage to generate an alternative narratives to economics to explain the interaction of humans, the environment. Inter As a matter of fact, this bioeconomics uh, narrative is very very nice about the fact that you have both the institution, social practice, the constraints coming from the environment and the constraints coming from the psychic structure. And this is how the system goes to a, an adaptive cycle. Uh, it is uh, much better to frame a discussion of sustainability. But if you are within the economic narrative, you are expressing everything in price and things, eh? there is nothing you can do. You, you may have... Uh, uh, information coming from different places, but it doesn't fit in the larger narrative. We need a larger narrative in which everyone uh, is is feeling comfortable, though, and and otherwise you cannot communicate. It is the other must. In order to communicate, you must have the same identity or cultural identity or group identity on the person with, with which with whom you are talking. And then we, I mean, uh, biophysical analysts are autistic. We are not capable of communicating because we do not share the same group identity with those they are talking within economic narratives. So it is Nor very the same difficult. language. Yeah, it is not language. It's more, eh? and that there is more. So um, this is a problem. This is a problem because unless we remove the intoxication with economic uh, talking or things, uh, because when you are using a, a word, the word comes with a lot of baggage. No. Uh, yeah, look, for example, in my institute, okay, uh, it's no longer my institute, I used it until last week. <laughs> I have the De Groot people, no? I have the headquarter of the De Groot on this planet. But still, what they say, De Groot. So this is an economic narrative. Either you De Groot, De Groot, Agro, Post Groot is the same. You are using an economic narrative. Is no, we have to do something else. Okay, we want to have uh, an economy of care. We have to care for each other. As long as you mention the word growth, then uh, it is very difficult to uh, think about doing things in a different way. So, like Georgios Kallis and them are yeah, in Georgios your is institute. My, oh, he used oh. to be my neighbor. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I didn't connect you were in the same university. Uh, obviously, that no, makes we're in sense. The same building. S same building. Uh, yeah. And Julia as well. Julia? What was uh, the last name? S Steinberger? Uh, yeah, that, they, they, it's not in the institute. Oh, they, with they, them. she yeah. collaborates with, with Georgios. Yeah. So, um, does this get at something in your work that you call quantitative storytelling? Yes, this is the, the things that we. Um, propose because when you are doing something very complex, there is no way that you can have the ultimate uncontested proof. No, or you know, they said that the, the smoking was not dangerous for the, for the health for forty years. You know, the merchant of doubt. In a sense, you can, uh, if you go on scientific based evidence, you pay scientists to prove that the. the the results are not accurate, uh, it was not enough, it is impossible to win. So we say, okay, when we are talking about these things, 
uh, we propose that we are having narratives. We have narratives and we put numbers to prove them. You know, I give you an example. Now in, in Europe, we do uh, recycled uh, cooked oil. Okay, recycled cooked oil. If you go around, you go to Stockholm, this bus goes on recycled cooked oil, we save the planet, blah, blah, blah. I say, okay, but how much <laughs> cooked oil we are having? Like five liters per capita per year. Okay, we can collect two. Uh, when collecting and transforming, it became one oil biodiesel per liter per person per year. And as a, we are <laughs> consuming 1,000 between gasoline. So what we are talking about, you know, and we have a lot of cooked oil. And why is that? Because there is a fraud. They are importing palm oil. So they are actually <laughs> cutting the forest in Indonesia to have the bus in the Stockholm. They run. And, and what happened? We don't need models. We don't need no models. We, it's, it's a narrative. You know, the narrative is, is this, there is not enough. Uh, look, these numbers are this. That's it. Let's do something else. We don't need an, an accurate, you no, know, with two decimal. Uh, so we use this uh, in the sense we tell a different story. Uh, the, valid, the quality of the story is whether you feel uh, feel that this is convincing or then you can check your own on your own the numbers uh because it's totally transparent it's not about you know doing these models that uh, and then we call it quantitative storytelling and i think that is uh, to me uh, especially for uh having a deliberation with people is because if you would force all these people to have magic models, no, that the they are decarbonized Europe in 20 years, all the models, you see, that nobody knows, no? You can imagine in 20 years you have to build thousands of millions of windmill to new factories, you know, in, all in 10 years, and the reduction go down, no? You, we should have a peak of emission uh, incredibly high, no? But all the, all the scenarios goes down. Uh, so, if rather than having mysterious models, we will force people to tell their story and they put numbers on the story, it will be easier to check the quality of the discussion. So, so the, then you would need focus groups of people uh, to yeah, hear I mean, the stories. The, there, are, there are a lot of participatory processes. You may have even citizen jury. This will be even better, not like uh, in the trial with people say in favor, people against. Uh, but but then you get to the human behavior section and authority bias and, and all those other things because your quantitative storytelling may be absolutely true, but it's also threatening and a little scary and there's no easy answers. So people will reject hearing yeah. it, even if it's accurate. Yeah, yeah, but it's already happening, Nate. I mean, I let's, let's face it. People yeah. do not want to hear about, you know, it's much easier. Oh, it is, I don't know, I don't know. Of course, I especially for kids. Yeah, I'm also kids are young people, 25. <laughs> uh, it's difficult because it's their future. Uh, and they want to do, but they are totally disempowered. I mean, if I am in a society in which technical innovation and market uh, business models define my future, I do not play any role. And this is why they are taking pictures of themselves, just to, <laughs> to prove that they are alive. They are part of the story because they are not part of the story. They are not building the common identity. Young people are completely out. Uh, and this is a tragedy. Yeah. No, I I agree with that. So um, it is my belief that one of the most underutilized resources in our world today is young people, smart, civic-minded uh, graduate students at universities around the world who can contribute meaningful and relevant research to this, what I call the human predicament, except as you said earlier, most universities are reductionist, energy blind, uh, under the thrall of economic theory. So as a, as a recently retired, very recently last week, um, a biophysically literate professor, can you suggest uh, to any university people listening to this program, what are some questions or core areas of research 
should these young humans who are in their early 20s or mid 20s and agree with what you're saying what what are some good areas of of research that we need orders of magnitude more people looking at uh, yeah, that's for sure energetics the thermodynamic non-equilibrium, all the discussion of uh, the symmetry system, complex system theory, hierarchy theory, the Im implication of scale, because <laughs> we imagine that there is only one scale, it is not. Uh, all the, what we are talking about, there are scales that go from molecules, chemical reaction to geological year, <laughs> whatever. We don't have the slightest idea. You have different disciplines that do not talk to each other because they see different things. So they are living in parallel universes. We don't have, uh, so what I'm saying, uh, biosemiotic for this, this is uh, unbelievable how powerful well, can, it is. Can you, I'm sorry to interrupt, can you define biosemiotics? Because I'm not okay, even sure because what that at means. At the beginning, we had the semiotic, the use of sign, uh, the interpretation of sign in the language, blah, blah, blah. And then at a certain point came this biosemiotic, uh, what is it, 1907, I mean, really very old, Van Uckel. And, and then uh, uh, this was um, about how the living system managed to generate sign and use sign to reproduce itself. And then this is uh, a general uh, um, um, process that is happening on all level. And then this goes, this is where you get into the adaptive cycle. No, as soon as you have a sign, you have a type that is not material. And why sign, this is S-I-G-N, sign? Sign, sign, yeah, yeah. something that means something. Okay. So in reality, you have an information carrier it would be DNA, a word, whatever, which has a meaning. So the issue is how to generate the meaning. You can generate the meaning if you have what is called a functional cycle, something that depends on <laughs> interpreting right the sign in order to survive, okay? And basically this is the way life works and how uh, human system works uh, and, and so on is exactly the same. Uh, it is uh, pretty much established, but Again, in scientific terms, they are on, on the border because they are not considered. I went now in Copenhagen to the latest uh, gathering, and it was like Harry Potter, you know, this kind of... <laughs> they are not considered like uh, uh, serious scientists, and nobody knows why, because in my view, it's probably the most interesting field at the moment. And then wh what is very good about biosemiotic is that basically you can see that you have values that came from uh, passion, from feeling, and then you get norms that came from the rational part. And then you cannot imagine to run a system only on rational behavior, model, norms. You have to include how the formation of values is influencing that. So in my view, this is much, much uh, richer than what we have at the moment. Because at the moment, we have really something is sad. Uh, economics is sad. You don't have a, a room for uh, a feeling. You don't have a room for environment. Yeah, uh, uh, really, is not getting anywhere. I mean, so so in a perfect world, just uh, speculate and and imagine that universities around the world um, start thinking about scale have a lot more questions and research on energetics and biosemiotics and thermodynamics, and we start to create a better map of our reality. Um, wh what, wh what could universities uh, look like in 10 or 20 or 30 years, and what contribution could they make to a uh, peak and descent of the carbon pulse? But I believe that what they could do is to involve the society in the formation of new group identity. Because again, this is not about technology or business model. It's about forming a new group identity. We have to move from producing and consuming goods and services to taking care of ourselves and nature. No, uh, so People have to understand this, have to feel this is the point. It's not about explaining. It's about explaining this 
on issues that are relevant for their life in a way that they start feeling it. Mm-hmm. So this is the issue because otherwise it remain on 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 the top. It's like the the all, all the fr- I mean I have a lot of uh, students. They are uh, as I say vegetarian, no eating uh, vegetable coming from Peru in refrigerated airplanes. But then they have three mobile phone. They go they vacation on uh, skiing on on uh, Saint Moritz, no. Uh, mm, there are symbolic things that. I don't think that being vegetarian at the moment is a threat from the banking system. <laughs> uh, uh, let's let's be the people do not make the connection uh, because moreover, if you frame the discussion, we need more technical innovation, more business models. You are saying we need to give more money to the banks. I'm not sure that this is the right strategy to get out of the trouble where we are now. Uh, but it seems that nobody makes these connections at this moment, no? So at the core of what you just said is we're not going to change until we feel uh, the need to change. Yeah, yeah and, yeah. and hopefully that can be scientifically and biophysically informed, informed. or maybe there are some yeah. some break glass plans uh, from universities like your own. Yeah, but to, to have around. disciplines that start in including in the discussion that there is this aspect, the feeling yeah. and the role of emotions, uh, because otherwise, I don't think that nothing happened with the just information eh? and moreover you are telling them there is no problem we can do it yes we can more technology and then you say you have to radically change your behavior why i should because if if, but i mean the the story is so absurd at the moment we are doing innovation to stabilize the social practice it's ridiculous let's imagine we have cars no we don't want to have cars anymore we have hundreds of millions of cars now what we do hundreds millions of cars electric you know Jesus, abolish the private property of cars, and then they must share, otherwise they're going to go. This is change of social practice. No, they change technology to keep the same social practice. Uh, you know, this is uh, a famous uh, no- Italian novel, The Gatto Pardo, no? Uh, the, after the revolution, you say, but how did you change everything so everything remained the same? No? <laughs> it is exactly the plan now. We are doing all these things to keep the, the status quo. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, that Giorgios, who is a friend of mine, uh, was in your same building. Yeah. What, what do you think about, you mentioned it briefly before, but what do you think about the degrowth uh, post growth growth debate beyond you know they're all using the terms of of economics uh, you have an yeah, opinion I mean, the 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 growth uh, i believe there was a provocation basically no? to and of course it was not very easy to communicate as a matter of fact since they moved from <laughs> the growth to post grow uh, they got money. <laughs> they got 10 millions, no? And immediately, as soon as they move from the grow to post grow. Uh, because post grow, at least, is more uh, reasonable in the sense. Because if you do the grow, you say more or less of the same. We do not want the same. We want something else, no? So to me, post grow is much better. As a matter of fact, I, I told them several times to go from uh, to post grow. Uh, again, I see that there is no an alternative in terms of grand narrative about how humans organize themselves and how they interact with the with the environment, let alone uh, considering the fact that a different society are competing with each other to to trade no so uh, there is not the the economic narrative is not is not good we have to a look for something else where to accommodate the discussion and it is crucial the role of feeling because if you have a description of how a society works without explicitly <laughs> having a, a, a place where human emotion feeling aspiration dreams taboo fears are uh, acting that is basically where they affect policy political 
processes. They, we do not have it. They are is completely separated. No, it's so rational a friend of behavior. Mine, a friend of mine who's been on this program a few times, Nora Bateson, lives in huh. Sweden. She does these things called warm data labs, which is to present a scientific overview of some problem but then integrate it with the feelings and responses of the people in the room and it's iterative and emergent and that's kind of what you're talking about yeah, yeah, in a this way. Is good. the, the yeah. important is that the, the data coming about the sustainability should be integrated on different aspects you know like Again, the medicine. <laughs> How is your liver? How is your... You must have information about all your organs before making a discussion of what we do. Hmm. Because if you do this only what one part of the story, uh, is much better than nothing, of course. But it would be important to have a narrative that can get all the aspects of the problem together. Uh, and then on that, you are asking the reaction of the people. Could this happen at universities that you have representatives from different disciplines and departments uh, meet once a week and have this like warm data discussion about how their discipline contributes to this larger backdrop? Or, or is they, it they just should too do that? They should yeah. do that. The only problem, look, I tried to do that in Naples about waste management. So we had a fantastic model that how to the different the network of process of the, and then of course uh, as soon as you do that you show that what the politicians say is not possible either one party or another <laughs> they want, uh, so what happened when we arrived to the fact to we want to have a, a, a open meeting at the university with the activists the citizen concerned citizen and the politician and the people running the waste management system and the politician didn't want to come because of course you have to have uh, uh, this this is the problem. I mean, now we are getting in a serious problem. Okay, the future do not doesn't exist. Okay, the future is created by us. So when you have a problem, you cannot have the uh, map what to do, the target things, because you have to discuss with people what are viable, desirable, the feasible things. No, in general, parties are defining themselves on solutions okay so this makes difficult to uh, have a deliberation because you should say okay in what the party a say there are good ideas but this is rubbish and what party b say there are good ideas this is rubbish and parties and maybe at least in Naples when we tried were not willing to do that we were really unlucky because they had the, the election in less than one year, so they were, it was a delicate moment. Uh, but this is the point. In general, at the moment, uh, we have roadmaps. Everyone has roadmaps. Nobody checks if whether these roadmaps are possible, what they mean for other people. Uh, so uh, for, rather than starting with roadmaps, we should have some sort of platform in which people could deliberate about pros and cons of different solutions. And I believe that this should be done by university, yes, or it could be done by government or whoever of the different possible actors. I'm trying to do it in a small way with this podcast, uh, uh -huh. um, I think, as, as you were speaking. So, so let, me, um, let me ask you a, a hard question, but with a, an academic um, uh, link. So you, are, you use in your MOOS CSM uh, um, multi-scale integrated analysis, but it's very difficult for humans to optimize more than one variable at a time. And a lot of people now are concerned about keeping GDP growing, but we're also concerned about equality and we're also concerned about emissions and carbon. So how, is it possible to optimize more than one variable at, at one time? Uh, the, the easy question is no. As, as a matter of fact, I am in, in Barcelona because I came here in 92 because I had a, a good uh, uh, center for multi-criteria analysis. So I was mm -hmm. trying to link 
multi-criteria analysis of my type of models because every time you change something in the lens, you change one indicator on the radar diagram. That's but right. then you get on the bottom line is, okay, you have this representation on the multi-criteria space and then uh, how to weight the different factors. Okay. In reality, the criteria of performance are mapping onto concerns. So at a certain point, you have to map the concerns of people. Uh, this is impossible. You cannot do right. it with, with software. Uh, I am concerned for my daughter. Another person doesn't have kids is not as the same concern that I have, and, and so on. So this idea that you can optimize multi-criteria things is absurd. But even the people doing multi-criteria will tell you. Because the, the real issue is when you get to the weighting factors how to weigh the different factors for but, the different but that, idea. That, but that at its core is what society faces right now. We have been optimizing one variable, which is yeah. dollars and profits. And now we care about ecosystems and future generations and yeah. equality and, and other things. So we don't, we're, we're flying blind into that. Yeah, no, I mean, because we are uh, continuing to try to solve the problem with optimization, find the best possible way. That these things do not exist. You have to negotiate, <laughs> you have to deliberate to understand the problem of the others and the others have to understand your problems. At that point, you can find a solution, but the solution has to be created co-produced. So what the scientists can do is helping the society in this process, not tell the society what is the best thing to do. This is ridiculous. So how do we bring governance on these issues, whether in Barcelona or in Spain or in the United States or even something broader like the European Union? How do we bring governance back towards a perspective that can actually look at the full scale of the issues we face. Is that possible? Can it be done with our current structures of, of government? Personally, I don't know. I think that it's not possible with the current structure of people that we have. People are used to not to get into this type of discussion. Uh, so they they hope that there is someone else that knows better, no? <laughs> this is why the, the establishment cannot say we don't know better. Uh, we, like with the COVID, you remember the COVID, they didn't have an idea what to do. Uh, but of course, they cannot say it. I mean, this is a cultural. Uh, we have to learn as a society to take decision under uncertainty. And we, we are not, our culture is not based on this. Our culture is based on NASA, the things they know, or they have a computer. They uh, And then these make difficult to have a healthy or quality governance because people want someone else that know better tell them what to do in in my opinion and this opinion was shaped or began to be shaped 15 years ago when i was getting my phd you are one of those people that knows what's going on and so i will put you on the spot on what to do what what types of policies given what you know about energetics and thermodynamics and complex adaptive systems might you recommend that governments start adopting whether on a local regional or or national scale not to put you on the spot in your your fresh retirement uh, look i mean i really i don't know i mean um, what i believe is completely irrelevant <laughs> i cannot decide for other people you know, there are people that can say, I prefer to do this and die rather than do that. And that maybe for me would be more reasonable. What I would say first, to stop wasting money on this technical innovation that is, uh, is uh, I, I don't know, gravy train, maybe that all <laughs> are getting money. Look what happened with the, with the energy vendor in Germany. This was very interesting. They want to do alternative energy. They spent 300 billions. After 300 billions, they are producing electricity exactly like <laughs> where to do before. Picker, loader, and the intermittent, since there are no storage, uh, cannot cover much. So basically, they have been building enormous amount of uh, intermittent power capacity that is not used. <clears throat> so the idea is rather than putting 300 billions given to the usual uh, multinational, uh, they say, okay, I give to all the towns, 
you know, uh, 100 million to one. If they came out with some plan to do something, maybe something good here and there will come out in the sense, stop to do a um, mega plan, especially since they are not particularly <laughs> good at making the plans or at making the analysis. Try rather to have, uh, uh, try to have an emerging uh, solution from the bottom that they can be readjust. Uh, try because the, amount, the more you go to on regulation, big plan, big money, first of all, the more the lobbies get in and they will get the money. And, and second, at the moment, we do not have good understanding, good analysis, a good uh, plan, let alone roadmaps. Uh, I would save money and try to use it in a different way. So that's what we need first and foremost is a better understanding of the problem and then inform people at the local levels and give a portion of the money that would have went to some multinational to try. You want to change social practices. You don't want to change technology to keep the social practices we are doing now. This is right. exactly the opposite of what we have to do. Yeah, I understand that. But then this uh, has to be done at the lab because when you do a social practices, no, practice with an S only, you are affecting your neighbor. You don't do it as a, an individual. It's not a behavior, a social practice. It's uh, something which is within the household, which is a functional type. So if you are a mother of two, you will not have a behavior. If you are single or a mother of two, it's not about behavior. It's about you are forced to do different social practices. Yeah. You see, then this is another uh, legacy of, of economics. We don't have behavior to change. <laughs> we have to think what are the social practices they are acceptable, not acceptable, the people likes or not like. And this implies interaction with the others is a social construct. Yep. Our relationships with others, with the natural world are just n totally not part of our economic system right yeah, now. Yeah. Um, dare I ask you your opinion on Europe's plans to scale hydrogen and green hydrogen? Is that another waste of resources or Look, what are your thoughts? Compare with the electric car. <laughs> I believe the hydrogen is much better. Uh, it's much better because uh, you can store it, you can use uh, uh, wind, whatever. Uh, you eliminate the problem of intermittency. Uh, for Europe, uh, would be uh, the salvation because if they go with electric car, China will produce them. They are dead. Uh, this will be the last industry in Europe gone. Uh, uh, is it also easier to transport? Uh, it is very difficult to handle. So maybe. The idea would be to do hydrogen and with hydrogen do other synthetic fuels and then use that. Uh, I really don't know how is the state of the technology. I know that especially in Germany, they are investing a lot of money because it's about surviving in terms of uh, automotive industry. Right. Uh, but if I would suggest, I would suggest more to do that rather than the electrification of the economy. Yeah, the yeah, electrification yeah. Of the economy is very, very uh, complicated. Uh, look, half of the labor in the energy sector is in the energy grid. Even though it's produ uh, giving only 30% of the energy, use half of the work because it's complicated in maintenance. And especially if you start going through low density area, oof, I believe that uh, liquid fuels or things are uh, easier to handle. But yeah. again, I'm not sure. I I don't know the state of advancement of the technology in hydrogen production. I have some final questions that I ask all my guests, um, Dr. Gian Pietro. Uh, uh -huh. You have thought about and are working on these issues as a career. Uh, you understand what we face with the carbon pulse and energetics, et cetera. Do you have any personal advice to the watchers and, and listeners of this program, given this time of what's happening in the planet, what, what some would call a polycrisis? Yeah, I would say to be curious, to be trying to be informed as much as possible, trying to look for 
alternative <laughs> the resistencia to be uh, to check also what is happening in the outside the mainstream uh, but i agree that it's very 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 difficult very very difficult uh, because the establishment doesn't make it's not a conspiracy of course but i mean it is not easy to try to get alternative uh, information uh, in in this situation and what about your students and young people generally what what do you recommend your students uh or 20 something year olds listening to this program do you have advice for young humans yeah, I, my advice has been uh, to avoid the like Mozart, così fan tutto. They not not they do not have to do things because the other do. That is on fashion, or because it's the only way that I have to get a job. Is maybe you will get a job in the next four or five years, but probably in twenty years, uh, you will not be on on the edge of what is needed. I mean. We are experiencing a major change uh, in in our situation, and of course, if you start doing things that at the moment are not on fashion, maybe they will be the one needed in ten years when you will be on 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 the top of your career. Uh, I understand that it's difficult uh, for young people to go against the the wind, uh, but. I'm not sure that going with the wind uh, at the moment is uh, uh, is guaranteeing you a good job in the 20 years. Eh? So when I taught my class at the University of Minnesota, I told my students that in the future, they would simultaneously be thanking me and cursing me. Is that the same story with your former students? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I had a very, very nice, uh, the last PhD student, he said, what they was asked to do a job in a different place, he said, when you experience the museum, you never get back. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to go to conventional analysis now. Um, it is, it, it is difficult. It, it is difficult. Yeah. It, you will have to go against the wind. And on the other hand, I believe that as scientists, we are really privileged. No, we are paid for doing what we like doing. Uh, so, uh, it is like a priest, like a vocational, vocational <laughs> career. No, you have to do what you think uh, has to be done. I mean, really. And at the moment, uh, I'm telling you, it's really embarrassing. If you n n see the things from 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 the big picture, the sustainability science is really, really sloppy. I mean, really. Yeah, no, I'm I'm aware of that. Mario, what do you care most about in the world? Uh, this is one million question. I I would say affective interaction, to be able to have interaction that we can have a uh, feeling on and, and stop to marketize everything that we have to have price, you know, whatever you do, you have to pay for or whatever, uh, to have more uh, personal relation, no? that we manage to, uh, in the family, outside the family, in the community, wherever we go, even across different countries, no? to, to always have some sort of affection in type of interaction and the one do no? that uh, this yeah. is something that is uh, jeopardized at the moment no we have more you, agency you, would you would you call that agency for people to have oh, agency oh effective agency <laughs> yeah effective there agency. must be some uh, uh, effect some sort of you in it yeah yeah that um, this would help a lot if you had a magic wand and there was no personal recourse to your decision and you're also retired, what is one thing you would do to improve the future? <laughs> Again, this is like what I would do really doesn't matter because I am, is my personal opinion. It's not, I don't feel so arrogant to decide for the life of other people. I would like to have people that are more uh, reflexive. Let's put it, I would, I would have a wave of reflexivity to people to reflect about what they are doing. And uh, because at the moment, this is something that is, we are losing, uh, pretty much i mean that people do things without having uh, yeah. the slightest idea what they do that 
So we should be more proactive and reflective reflect, instead of and, reactive. Uh, yeah, and and respect the others also. No, that and we since I'm Buddhist, in the others I include also animals and the rest of. We should respect more. Uh, I, I I knew there was a reason I always liked you. <laughs> uh, respect for animals is something respect. I, I, well, I we have to respect. We don't respect anything. Like I, I don't want to be now uh, impopular, but all these tattoos. No, I mean you have to respect your body. The body is not yours. You, you got it. <laughs> you got it, and then you have to leave it uh, as in the best possible condition. I mean, you will not write on 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 animals or on, uh, why you should write on yourself. I mean, no, I don't know. We don't respect not even ourselves. This is the moment. So let me, um, uh, if, if this has been a great introduction to you and your work, uh, sometimes I have my guests come back for a second podcast six months down the road where they take a deep dive in some topic that they're an expert in, but it's a little bit esoteric, but it's also relevant to human futures. Is there any topic that you are just passionate about that if you were to come back, you could take a deep dive and, and explain it to the viewers? Oh yeah, for sure. The extinction of farmers. This is, uh, is amazing. I've been in Japan for one month. The average age of Japanese farmers is 70. Listen to this, 70. They do not have agriculture anymore. In Europe, it's 60. If you go wherever you go, the farmers are gone. They are going, you know. <laughs> I, I spoke in Argentina at uh, the, the meeting of the, basically there, they no longer have farmers. They have people that make exploitation from the city. They rent three, 4,000 hectares. They go there with tractors and things. But I mean, the rural communities and farmers are disappearing all over the planet and nobody cares. I mean, this is fascinating. If they were, I don't know, lesbian, GDP, whatever will protest about the fact that this community is going, but that the farmers are going is completely irrelevant for the urban civilization that we are living in. This, this would be really something, huh? Eh? At this deserve uh, <laughs> not one hour, but because I mean, you urbans believe that the, that the food comes from the supermarket and whatever else happened before doesn't matter. And the farmers are not economically viable, period, uh, in, in the uh, international market uh, with the pressure that they have. They, they need subsidies, otherwise they, they cannot, they don't even do it well with the subsidies. 1% of Americans in the United States are farmers and only 1% of them are growing food they can actually eat uh -huh. um, as opposed to soybeans and things yeah. like that. I may take you up on that and come back. So let me ask you a final question. Uh, it's around dinner time in Barcelona. Yes. Can I ask you what, uh, I love coming to Spain. What are uh -huh. you going to have for dinner tonight? Do you have an idea? Uh, no. I think uh, eggplants for sure. Maybe chicken and rice. I don't know. I didn't check that. Okay. Will you Wine. have some olives? Acetuna? Uh, olives to, to start, yes. <laughs> it's very popular here. Yeah. Acetuna. Uh, it's uh, great to talk to you. Thank you for yeah, your time. Well, thank you very and much for having me. Congratulations on your retirement. And yeah. I think the world is still going to need your your expertise, I'm not uh, sure. Professor. <laughs> <laughs> the autistic scientist. Okay, thank you very much. It's been fun. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please follow us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases. This show is hosted by Nate Hagens, edited by No Troublemakers Media, and curated by Leslie Batlutz and Lizzie Siriani.